uh, uh, wanted to welcome everybody to our 59th in a row installment of the Band of Angels Sum Ventures uh, uh, joint meeting. We are uh, uh, really, uh, I'm really thrilled that all of you can, you can make it on because it's just been uh, it's been a busy month and I have a lot to update you on, but I'm going to I'm only half a drink in. So I'm going to be pretty brief in my comments, hopefully tonight, and, and we'll try and be brief late, uh, as the night goes on as well. Uh, the uh, band was formed is the actually the oldest angel investment group out of Silicon Valley. I've been a member for gosh, going on about seven years now, and uh, it's been a, a wonderful to be a part of that group. And from that group and from my angel investing activities, uh, some ventures was launched. And some uh, is our seed stage fund based here in LA, but one of our partners has joined uh, on the call tonight, Elizabeth out of uh, Seattle. And we have principals and venture partners all over the country actually. And it's really great to have sort of that diverse network of, of sourcing and diligence uh, join us uh, on these calls, really gives us a great competitive advantage. Uh, but really one of the cores to our uh, sourcing advantages is really just all of you and really happy that you can uh, <laughs> that you all take the time out of your month. Morning and morning the... breath, breath. Okay, we're gonna try and mute folks just for a moment. Okay, uh, I'll, I'm happy that you can all uh, take the time to to join us uh, this month. And the way the the meeting is gonna run tonight is we're going to have a series of sort of quicker updates from uh, portfolio companies, uh, and then we are go I'm gonna share a few updates on co for companies that could not join us. And then we're gonna have four companies present. We're gonna have a 10 minute presentation followed by 10 minutes of Q and A. And one of the things that, that makes this, this group really special in my opinion, is that it's not just some ventures, it's not just the band of angels looking at these deals. Well, at the end of the meeting, we do take a vote and uh, companies do advance specifically within the band. But I uh, make it a point to invite members of Tech Coast Angels, Pasadena Angels, Park City Angels, and all groups from around the country uh, to participate and, and, and share deal flow. And of course, they're welcome to join the band. And that's uh, part of the reason why Ostley is on this call, because she is the go-to person now for, for membership information and uh, recruitment and whatnot. So if you want to join the band, absolutely uh, uh, reach out to her, talk with uh, talk with Ostley. She'll give, she will give you that uh, information. So I think that that... Uh, Kind of, kind of covers it. Just to, just to recap again, ten minute presentation, ten minutes Q and A. We're going to have a, uh, a discussion at the end, and one or two, potentially two companies will end up moving forward with deal screening, uh, depending on sort of the, the group's uh, enthusiasm for for those companies. All right, let's see. What do we, what do we have next up? We'll have a couple of founders that have previously raised capital through the band, or and or just presented and and, and made it. Uh, far that uh, wanted to give some updates. I think Randy Marsden from Skedaddle is on with us this evening. I'm going to hand it over to him to share an update. Uh, Randy, if we could keep it to about three, three, four minutes max, that would be great. Actually, call okay. great. thanks, Garrett. First thing I'm going to do is change my background. I don't know how many hockey fans there are, but I got to show allegiance to my Oilers. Um, can you allow me to share? Yeah. Thank just you. To, just to let you know, I I lived in Calgary for a number of years throughout my childhood. So go Flames! <laughs> okay, so I'm really curious if you're cheering for the Oilers as the only <laughs> Canadian company, because I or yeah, because Calgary and Edmonton are big rivals. So yeah, right. Uh, for those who don't know, Skedaddle provides virtual signs using augmented reality in the real world. We can place these signs at geography locations, and they can be used for a whole host of things. And we've uh, raised about $600,000 in our first angel round, and we've got a bunch of tr traction I want to share with you. The first is we just went through a plug and play accelerator. We were accepted um, over several hundred companies, seven were selected. We got into this Barcelona Music Lab accelerator that was a partnership between Barcelona Music Labs and uh, plug and play. We just did our demo day last week. So we just came through that program, graduated. And an outcome of that is we got a pilot with the largest music festival in Spain called Korea. That is next month. It's about three weeks from now. Huge show. There's five stages. It's all outdoor. And we're going to be placing skedaddle virtual signs on all of those stages, telling people what's going on and so on. So that was a great outcome of the accelerator. We also won a pitch competition earlier this year with uh, the second largest 
uh, theme park in Europe called Portaventura World. And we are working with them now in an active pilot to place our virtual signs on all of the rides that show you the wait times. It shows you where merchandise can be purchased and so on. So that pilot is also underway. They also happen to be in Spain about an hour from Barcelona. So that makes it nice. We also have engaged in due diligence with Signorama. They're the largest franchise sign making company in the world. They have 700 different uh, retail locations, their franchises. They make physical signs. If you need a sign made, you go to Signorama. So when they heard about virtual signs, they were very interested. It's a good synergy. If you go to Signorama to get signs made for your music festival, they can upsell you and say, would you also like virtual signs with that? And so we're talking with them about a strategic partnership, which they say is a slam dunk. We're going to do that. And also a strategic investment. So we're gearing up for a seed round with them, which will be a priced round uh, of, of between one and a half and $2 million. So that's not a done deal. We're just in talks with them, but we should have that closed by the end of the summer. Uh, we are currently in our second angel round. We're raising up to a half a million dollars still as safes in our angel round. And we got such great traction. It's a great time to get on. As soon as we take in that strategic investment, the valuation is going to go up quite a bit. So if you're interested, please let Garrett know. That's it. Awesome. Thank, thank you very much, Randy. Uh, I believe that Cheryl, I saw her jump on. Cheryl, if you want to share an update on living pop-ups, and please also feel free to reach out to any of these founders via the chat window. We don't have a ton of time for Q&A for our update portion. Got to be kind of brief with this piece, but uh, reach out and, and, and uh, let them know if you want to learn more. Cheryl, how are you? It's nice to see you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, I'd love to uh, connect with you, Randy. We are an AR AI company that is a platform with a dashboard. We do um, do things in advertising as well. Um, we gather information by having 3D characters, ask you questions, collect in real time data. And we've been doing, um, we have um, a deep conversation going on with Quad Graphics, which is um, one of the largest publishing of for retailers like Target and stuff like that. And so they're looking at us as investment as well as um, signage in around store and um, in um, online and offline publishing. Also, we have a um, a proposal out on cybersecurity curriculum because we've pivoted with workforce development and um, that's very exciting and we should be hearing in a week or so, but it's um, all attached to curriculum that the DOD has already um, had and wants an uplift to, um, and so they're excited about it. That's just a 30 second wow. window. Okay. And, and I would encourage you, Cheryl, to drop in the link to Living Pop-Ups uh, for, for those who want to check out the website and actually see some of the books and the incredible content that you've created uh, in, the, in the past. I can say that uh, uh, it's truly some of the best, uh, highest quality augmented reality uh, content out of books that I've, I've ever seen. Uh, actors like Brian Cranston and uh, LeVar Burton and many others have participated in the books that Cheryl's created. And uh, I can tell you, my daughter's class loved them. And I got to go out to see Randy at South by Southwest. And I can tell that all the people at South by Southwest were using the Skedaddle app and his augmented reality experience. So we got two AR startups here. But now I'm going to just keep it. I got to keep it moving forward here, team. So we're going to, uh, uh, I'm going to call on Kevin Simmering to share about the, the, the upcoming launch with Target for uh, paperwork and some of the other updates real quick. And then we're going to move on. I, I want to stay on time as close to on time as I can with our presentations. And Zarina, don't worry. I'm going to introduce you to the group later on as well. We're going to get to everybody as we go tonight. Hi, <clears throat> thanks, Garrett. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, for those that don't know me, Kevin Simring, co-founder and CEO of Paperwork. Paperwork is a financial wellness platform that we white label for credit unions who in turn make the uh, financial wellness program available to their members. Uh, many credit unions work in partnership with corporate America. They have what they call corporate partners or select em employee groups that they work with. One of our credit union customers is BCU, Baxter Credit Union. 
that have about 160 of these corporate partnerships throughout the nation with some very large employer groups like Target, as Garrett mentioned, is one of them. So we've been uh, very focused on working with BCU to launch our financial wellness platform into the Target's employee base. Uh, that launch is scheduled to happen on July 1st, so not long to go. So we've been knee-deep uh, focused on that, and we're, we're launching with BCU nationwide to 400,000 employees of Target to make this financial wellness program available to them. Uh, part of the, the good news of that story is that we've been able to uh, place UNEST as one of our affiliate partners within the platform uh, in time for the launch as well. So, UNEST, so as folks work through our white labeled app and they uh, go through a, a number of different financial wellness topics, they'll also be able to, to click on a link um, that'll take them to UNEST if they're interested um, in that particular product. We have a number of other affiliates as well, but really uh, glad that we could get UNEST in there. And so, Garrett, I think in terms of the update for this evening, that's really the big news. That's the big milestone for us, uh, you know, massive launch. And then hopefully with the success of that launch, there'll be a, a lot of other of these big corporates to follow. So looking forward to to that. Awesome. Uh, and and thanks, thanks, Kevin, for the update and congrats, yeah. congrats on the progress. So Thank I'm going to share a couple of very, uh, very quick updates and I'll elaborate in the more of the discussion portion later on this uh, tonight. But uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar with Irigreen, the smart sprinkler system that uh, they say they 3D print water, which perfectly matches your yard. They actually had a feature on CNBC uh, a couple of days ago, the power lunch and uh, some ventured our fund got that got the shout out as uh, having been a part of that round. And actually we were the first uh, investors before all the other funds jumped in. Uh, and so that was that was kind of a, a nice win for us. And uh, I'll drop the and a, definitely a big win for Ear Green. I'll drop the link to that uh, that piece in the, in the chat window in a few moments if you're if you'd like to check it out. It's a nice three minute uh, segment. Uh, I would say that Brius is the news on Brius is probably some of the most validating I've I've had in a while as well. So for those of you who re recall, Brius is the lingual orthodontics company that braces that sit behind your teeth and move your teeth independently into place. Well, you know, I was actually the first angel investor, and then we invested as a fund into Brius. And uh, uh, when I when I made the investment, I remember there was a little bit of skepticism because there was another company called Inbrace. And Inbrace raised a couple hundred million dollars, about half of that debt and about half of it, or a little, a little more, like over a hundred million in equity and a, a large chunk in debt as well. And uh, I, uh, I always was adamant that you know what, despite the fact that we we're underfunded by comparison, that Brius would ultimately win out in the market because the technology was far superior. Well, uh, Inbrace filed for bankruptcy last week, and while we never wish anybody harm or you know no ill will was what wished upon him, it was kind of. You know, the, the writing was on the wall uh, that uh, Brius was going to become the market leader uh, in the orthodontic space. So I predict in the next few years that uh, you will see more and more Brius uh, uh, devices in, in installed to straighten teeth because they're truly invisible. They sit behind the teeth and they move teeth to, about half the time that it takes for traditional braces. So really happy that, uh, that Brius continues to do well and just closed uh, another $20 million investment. So the, the past few months. Um, let's see. I think that that's enough of an update. Oh gosh, I got to touch on one last one, and I know I'm running late, founders, but we'll we'll get to it. Uh, we made a, a an investment this past week in Fantasy Life, which is Matthew Barry. For those of you who are are sports fans, uh, Matthew Barry is the uh, leading columnist uh, and, and voice formerly from ESPN. He's now on Sunday Night Football, and uh, we uh, it made a sort of a final investment from fund one into fantasy life. Uh, and it was actually a pretty awesome opportunity because uh, LeBron James and Maverick Carter, uh, their family office led the deal with participation from a number of notable NFL players like Josh Allen, Austin Eckler, Larry Fitzgerald. The list goes on, on and on of, of NFL greats that were in the deal. The, the issue for Matthew was not about raising more capital. He could pick up the phone and, and raise the money uh, if uh, he needed to. He was looking for an intro to a great strategic VC that had a, a record of rolling up their sleeves and working alongside founders. And as a result, we got the last allocation uh, uh, through a warm introduction. 
And so we invested 300K and I have another chunk uh, that's uh, we're going to put uh, into an SPV and make it available for our LPs and friends of our network. So if you are a fantasy sports fan, if you are familiar with Matthew Barry and uh, what he's built with Fantasy Life, would like to learn more, shoot me an email. Uh, this is going to be one of those that we have kind of a limited window to execute on, but I'm happy to share our DD memo and happy to, uh, you know, just make it uh, make it as available to our some some ventures uh, and angel network as, as possible. So that I think is enough talking for me. Let uh, me hand it over to uh, John. I, I would like if you can uh, come on the video. That'd be oh, you're you're in the car. Would you like me to do the kin uh, uh, kinetic intro? This is a a, a some portfolio company. Albeit we got to get the water out next week, but Devin, I promise you, I'm good for it, and it is coming. Uh, but we are really excited to be participating in this in this deal. And uh, John, do you wanna do you wanna share anything? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Garrett. Hope everyone can hear me. Okay, I'm on the way back from a hockey game. Randy, unfortunately, it's not an Oilers game. We'll get to see them tomorrow night. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to the group uh, Devin Price, who is the CEO of a company called Vitanav, uh, which is the parent company for a brand called Kinetic, which is a functional uh, ketone beverage. And uh, Devin and his team have been getting uh, incredible traction uh, in the ketone beverage uh, sales space, uh, most notably recently with a, a partnership with Lifetime Fitness that I'm sure Devin will be happy to elaborate on. I've known Devin for a little over three years uh, as an advisor and early investor in his uh, venture there, and I'm really excited for all the opportunities that lie ahead for uh, for Devin, Vitan Ab, and the Kinetic brand. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Devin, who uh, will be able to fill everyone in on the uh, details here. Thanks, Garrett. Thanks, John. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, it truly is. Um, and to be, uh, you know, counted as uh, among the portfolio companies, I really appreciate your support and excited to work with you um, to grow this business. I really do believe that Kinetic is the future of functional beverages, and we've uh, we keep getting more and more evidence to support that um, every day. So I'll kind of start at the beginning. Um, uh, We've been at this for four years now. Um, this started as a kind of a really a, a passion project. My brother-in-law and I started uh, this business uh, about four years ago as we started experimenting with ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. And I got fascinated with the science around ketones. Um, and I'll I'll spare. I have a ton of slides in the appendix. We can we can get into the science in the Q and A section, but but I will um, just kind of give you an overview of of what kinetic is, um, what ketones are, and uh, where we're going, how we're bringing kinetic to, how we're making it available to um, really uh, the mainstream market. Um, <clears throat> so, just a few statistics for you to kick it off, 42% um, the uh, obesity rate in 2023, um, which had which has tripled over the last 50 years. Uh, the average adult attention span now is less than that of a goldfish at eight seconds. Um, that's a 33% decrease in the last 20 years. Uh, and at the same time, the energy drink sales in the United States is at 18.5 billion, which is a 13% annual increase. Um, so these probably aren't surprising to you. It's um, the you know, attention spans, the health and the fitness, the cognitive health and fitness um, of our population are, are declining. And, um, there's a huge reliance on on caffeine and sugar. The standard American diet uh, has, you know, had an impact along with our busy lifestyles. Um, and it's not a surprise to the market. This is not new um, information. Uh, and already, you know, the certainly the market is is responding to that. You can see that in the trends 
um, healthier functional ingredients are really becoming, um, as you see with the rise of, of Celsius in the last couple of years, becoming more and more popular. Um, traditional energy, energy drink consumers, those with caffeine, are prioritizing functional in ingredients, healthy ingredients. That um, is up seven percentage points in the last year. The share of ener the energy drink market since Q1 of 23 has doubled from 38% uh, to 75%. And those are energy drinks like Celsius that claim to have functional or better for you ingredients. And so people, clearly the market is, is seeking that out. Um, the challenge is, of course, that, you know, <laughs> while they claim to be healthy, it's still caffeine and really it doesn't deliver on you know, Celsius and, and the others don't deliver on, on the promises. It's caffeine and sugar and um, pixie dust, typically. Other ingredients that really don't do a whole lot. Kinetic, on the other hand, um, uses ketones. And that is a highly functional ingredient. Um, it's clinically proven to improve cognitive function. Uh, it supports lasting energy and it promotes overall well-being. Ketones are a molecule that your body naturally creates. It's an actual source of energy. It's the cleanest, most efficient source of energy for your brain. Um, and it has, it has, it's a signaling metabolite as well that, that um, causes, uh, that reduces inflammation, uh, reduces oxidative stress. And there are a growing number of, clinical studies that are showing all of the, you know, the vast benefits of ketones. So I'm going to share a... Caffeine is basically an energy band-aid. It messes with your sleep patterns and tricks your brain into thinking dopamine is energy. Either way, you are left with... Kinetic doesn't come with jitters or crashes, and it helps your body sustain energy over time. But don't take it from me. Take it from science. Kinetic uses ketones, your brain's preferred energy source. Ketones stimulate the production of new mitochondria. And what's the one thing you remember from middle school science class? That's right. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So drinking Kinetic's plant-based ketones improves your body's production and capacity for a new energy from cellular level. This means you become more energetic on your own over time, giving you the momentum you need to go throughout your day. You can naturally produce ketones in two to seven days through fasting, a strict low-carb diet, or endurance exercises. Or you can drink Kinetic's delicious ketones and still enjoy carbs. Experience real energy and visit drinkkinetic.com today. Caffeine is basically an energy. Oh, <laughs> go forward. There we go. Um, so the first drinkable ketones were actually developed about 10 years ago by the military. Um, they were developed to uh, allow soldiers to perform at their peak on extended missions without the you know, typical downsides of go pills and, um, and whatnot. Kinetic actually, so the, ch the problem with those drinkable ketones were that they tasted like nail polish remover, uh, and they're very, very expensive. And so not practical while the benefits are fantastic. Um, that just didn't make sense for the mainstream market and the typical consumer. Um, we have improved on that. Uh, original drinkable ketone formulation developed by Oxford and, and NIH. And we have three patents now are, are granted um, on our formulation. And we have one pending uh, with our large strategic partner, which is the actually the largest organic sugar producer in the world um, on the production of the um, ketone ingredient that we use in kinetic. So we have a nice, nice market protection for this as well. Um, again, our competitive advantage is really in that we have, in addition to the, you know, the, the market protection we have, we have solved the flavor cost trade-off, which is 
of, of drinkable ketones, which is really um, the obstacles that were preventing them from becoming, I think, the next major functional ingredient. Um, so with Kinetic, <clears throat> and I'm happy to send anybody here uh, samples if you want to try it. Um, Kinetic tastes good. 10 out of 10 um, in a blind taste test preferred Kinetic to Celsius. 50% uh, lower manufacturing costs compared to typical drinkable ketones, which occupy a niche market, and they're more effective. Um, you're going to get a, you know, it's two times as effective. You're going to get a two times elevation in your ketone levels than you will with um, ketone IQ, which is really the, the, the major ketone product out there right now, aside from us. Here's another... Here's another quick video before I hit play. No issues with the audio, are there? No. Cool. The following video was shot at Lifetime Fitness in Chicago on December 13, 2023. Subjects were not coached, guided, or otherwise influenced in their reactions, and any discussion or comparison to Celsius came organically, followed up with by a separate taste test only when prompted by the subject. Enjoy. Okay. This is Emma, and I'm going to try Keystone IQ. That is different. <laughs> oh, Ooh. it tastes like uh, it tastes like chemicals. I feel like a little bitter aftertaste too. Oh no! There's definitely like a chemical taste to it. The only time that'd be acceptable is if I was sick and I was using needed some medicine. I'm not a huge fan of this one. <laughs> tastes like medicine. <laughs> Tastes like it was made in a lab by people that don't know what they're doing, and it did not taste good. <laughs> See how this one goes. Way better. Oh my god, this is really good. I would drink this one. <laughs> I don't think I could drink the whole one of the other one if I tried. <laughs> I'd say so much better. Oh, thank you. Jeez, palate cleanser. Delicious, refreshing. Oh, this is good. I like this one. <laughs> yeah, this one is really good. And it's more like a, a fruity flavor. It doesn't have that strange aftertaste. Uh, I, I think we're gonna have to uh, move move it to Q&A here pretty soon, just so you know. I don't know, I feel like compared to Celsius, this okay. is like more, you're able to like just sip on it if you wanted to. So this is my Celsius drink. I walked into the gym with this today. We'll have a little taste test. The flavor's definitely better in Kinetic. It's a good tasting drink that Honestly, I can see myself drinking outside of just energy purposes. I'm going to go with Kinetic, for sure. Kinetic, it goes down a little bit easier. I like this one better. A ketone, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> to be completely honest, I actually like the Kinetic drink more than my own Celsius, which I walked into the gym with today. <laughs> yeah, you get the point. Um... I'll move it along, but just to give you a quick uh, overview of our go-to-market strategy here, we have three key segments. There's a group of kind of educated consumers in the clinical space, in the athlete endurance athlete space. Um, drinkable ketones have established a, a a good following, particularly in Tour de France um, riders. And also now that we have a drink that is actually tasty and cost-effective, um, ready to bridge the gap to the mainstream and the healthy high performer. Um, our channels that we're focusing on here include direct-to-consumer, obviously, through Shopify and Amazon. John mentioned the partnership that we have with Lifetime Fitness. We rolled out nationally in all of their 180 clubs perfect fit um, with our target customer, which is, you know, the high performing, busy, um, health conscious professional. Um, we also have in the endurance athlete space partnership with them, uh, the, the Lifetime Grand Prix, uh, which is the largest uh, mountain biking series in the world. And we just launched on the feed.com, which is basically the Amazon for nutrition. Um, and then finally, a partnership with Boulder Longevity Institute, um, ketone 
or I'm sorry, Kinetic Pro is a higher, uh, has a higher concentration of ketones and is available through clinical practitioners for people who actually need ketones to survive. Um, it is part of their clinical protocol, and I can go into more about why they need that later. Um, just very briefly on some financials and economics here. We are at a 75% gross margin in our direct to consumer. At wholesale, we're at 55%. We're coming down the curve on our cost of goods. I expect that we'll be at that 85 price point um, by the end of 2024, by the end of this year, with a run rate of roughly $6 million. Um, our sales have uh, grown substantially in the first, since we launched this new brand and this new formulation, um, along with our partnership with Lifetime, eighty percent month over month growth. Since since then, um, we're at a one point five million run rate. Um, expect to hit three million total sales this year. Um, we've also, you know, one of really the 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 magic secret ingredient here is customer retention, and we have a uh, overall forty one per or yeah forty one percent um, return uh, repeat purchase rate. So uh, this is this looks at six month periods over the last couple of years, and that compares to. Um, an industry average of uh, 24%. So we're well above typical D2C beverage. We got to the ask slide now. We, we, we have to. We got to move. All right. All good stuff. Growing. This one is really um, cool. You can ask about this in the, the next section, 35% market share in Columbia um, lifetime. And we're spreading that across the country. Awesome leadership team. Excellent brand partners um, and athletes and advocates. There is our good friend, John Paglia and sports and clinical advisors. And the use of our investment funds is really toward sales, marketing and inventory. Um, we're, we are um, uh, about to close this current round. We've, we've raised a total of 3.5 million in our, um, in our, history so far well, I, I hate to i hate to play the bad cop on these and force you rush you along but I, I have a feeling that you, you've been able to share enough that you're going to get some follow-up interest from 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 the group there Devin. we do have time for about two questions and we're gonna have to move the questions over to chat so i really want to make sure that we are on to the next presenter within by 5 45 pacific time so questions for the group from the group I had a question for you, Devin. It's Jason Bennett with some. So can you maybe speak to your strategy for grocery store and convenience beyond Lifetime? And then also, is there any limiting factors with the relationship with Lifetime that would keep you from partnering with other gyms? Yeah, we're going to wait to go into um, broader retail until we've got a really, until we've really, you know, squeeze the value out of lifetime. We have an opportunity here to establish a uh, a large loyal customer base within our target segment in a very focused way. The other benefit of lifetime is that we have an extended sales force within among their 3000 um, personal trainers. Um, so we have a, so we're going to, we're going to focus on that rather than go to retail and extend our, you know, um, our cash flow situation um d to c is is nice because we get paid you know the next day um rather than having to put a whole lot of inventory out there uh we do we do have a, a wholesale offering um for direct uh to you know specialty retail stores um uh but we're not making a big push into large retail until we've got until we're much you know larger Great. Uh, we have a question around price point, uh, specifically compared to uh, Celsius, and that's uh, coming from Fred Carey, who I look forward to welcoming to the group later on in the when we get to discussion. Fred, thanks for making the time to join us tonight. All right, you want to talk about the the price point of uh, Kinetic relative to Celsius? 
Yeah, sure. It's uh, the MSRP is four ninety nine, um, which is you know competitive with typical energy drinks, but elevated um, because it is a premium product. We're not having any any trouble. In fact, uh, in that uh, that slide I showed you with the thirty percent market share um, compared to, which is compared to Celsius is 25% in that lifetime fitness, we're selling at $5.99. So uh, folks are not price sensitive to functional drinks like they are with, you know, the more commoditized typical energy drink. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll close off by saying it really doesn't, it doesn't hurt the, it tastes so darn good because you sent me, you sent me a case and uh, it's, it's really, Really fan fantastic, and I actually shared it with uh, Brent Selleck, who wanted to join the call tonight. Former uh, Eagles tight end, and he uh, he's he's going to order some, and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we got to hopefully get some more brand ambassadors on board. But thanks for making the time. I'd ask you to stick around, share your contact info. Uh, also, uh, if there are other questions, please send them uh, in the chat window. We just want to make sure we have enough time for our three other presenters and uh, a couple of other founders who. Uh, I want to highlight before they present next month as well. So we're going to keep it uh, moving. But thanks, thanks, Devin. Great, great work. Um, we're going to go next up. We got Robert, and I want to thank uh, Cal for making the uh, the intro to Robert with SQL. Uh, I think it's pretty. If we, you guys who know me know that uh, I really enjoy finding uh, great people building companies that make an impact, but are also ha have an eye on the bottom line and and, and have a chance to. To really grow exponentially, and uh, uh, Robert really uh, just comes through. Uh, all of the founders and I really come through the, the grit, determination that they bring. But I think that the the way in which Cal described Robert early on with the with the persistence and the tenacity that he's brought to building this business uh, is really uh, impressive. One of the things of also about this group is that you'll see everything from pre seed usually up until Series A companies, because I like to I like to keep a you know kind of a wider a variety of opportunities. So this is a little bit on the on the later stage side. Uh, Cal, uh, would you mind uh, making a, a further intro for Robert, and uh, and then we'll let him take it away. Well, um, I was introduced to to Robert by okay. a couple. Of different Didn't courses. have enough time on that one, but whatever. Um, and um, I had him present to our Tiger 21 groups and several of our members invested in both a first round and a second round. So we're real believers in, in what he has achieved. Well, thanks for that, Cal. Yeah, hey, everybody, I'll, uh, I'll try to be brief, uh, leave room at the end for questions. So Rob the Wolf, founder of SQL, we're a platform in the youth and high school sports space. And, uh, you know, before I go into really what we do, I think the why of building everything is quite important. Uh, four years ago, my best friend from high school, he and I moved back to Richmond, Virginia. And we went back down, we went down a big rabbit hole one day that there's a ton of inequalities in youth sports. Uh, I grew up in a very financially fortunate background. So my parents could pay for highlight tapes, trainers, nutritionists, the whole nine, right? My parents had it. Uh, unfortunately, my best friend grew up in a lower income household and he couldn't afford the resources I had access to. Far superior athlete than I was, night and day. But because my parents had money, I was on a pedestal and he was here. Uh, long story short, we said that's BS. Uh, color of your skin, where you're from, parents' financial status, you know, that shouldn't affect your sports career. And at the same time, we said, hey, we think we can build a company around this. There's 150 million people in the youth sports space. That's athletes, parents, all in. And if we could really build this community, uh, we could find different customers that want access to this cohort, uh, this network we're building. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, we're growing at 300% a year. Uh, last year was our first year doing revenue. We did a million Lost a little bit. Uh, this is our second year of doing revenue. We'll do three and a half million. Uh, we are profitable year to date. And because of being profitable in our current growth, we're raising our Series A. In fact, the first close was today. Uh, so we have about a million and change left. So I'm going to share my screen, show you, you know, what we provide the customers, what we do for the athlete, and then uh, you know, leave room at the end. 
So it should be in present mode. Do y'all see that or no? Looks good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So here's what we do. Okay. 150 million people in the youth sports space. And we work with brands. We work with leagues and we work with cities that use our platform to access youth athletes and their families. So massive market. However, you know, this student athlete there and their family, they're difficult to reach. And each one of these customers has a different motivation to interact with an athlete. So we work with leagues, you know, our customers are the NBA, the NHL, and their goal with youth sports is to get everybody involved. They want digital fandom because if an athlete is a fan of the NHL, they're going to tune into that big game tonight, right? Uh, we also work with cities. So sports tourism is a large driver for economic impact, but they do not have credible data on where to track sports tourists or how to get them back to town. So our customers, you know, Sports Pittsburgh, they pay us to access this uh, network because Garrett, you know, if they have access to your contact information, your means, they will market to you and your family to come there for sporting events. Uh, we also work with social impact partners. So this is companies in the sports space, out of the sports space that have pledged billions of dollars to do good in their community. Uh, because that shows that only helps the bottom line. So, for instance, we work with Adidas. It's a four-year agreement where we provide underserved Black and Hispanic soccer players uh, with adequate resources. Uh, then we also uh, have not tapped into this, but it's brands. Uh, that's the largest TAM, uh, for sure, from a revenue perspective. But they all want access to this youth athlete network. Uh, and as our network, as our database grows, we know this will be the largest revenue driver. So here's what we do. We provide student athletes resources for free, paid for by each one of these customer constituents that then gets access to very, uh, very uh, valuable first party data. So for the value add for an athlete is we say, hey, we're going to give you all this free stuff. You sign up for our app and we're going to give the data to the customer. Uh, so one big resource is photographer and videographer services. Uh, we actually have the largest videographer network in the entire country. And I want you to think of this as an Uber network. 1099 contractors for us. We send them the games. Student athletes, you know, they want these moments to share to college coaches, to their socials. Parents want this to show to their friends, their colleagues. Uh, and when we do this at an event, we have a 97% app download rate. The organizer of the tournament puts QR codes around the arena that says free highlight tapes, you know, let's just say paid for by the city of Pittsburgh. Obviously, Pittsburgh gets access to that valuable data, but the athlete, you know, they get these free moments. And uh, this is what it looks like. So in your face content that, you know, obviously has that virality effect. Uh, we also want to educate student athletes. You know, a core motivation of student athletes is getting better on and off the field. Uh, and in our app, we have a master class like experience where you can learn from the best athletes in the world how to get better on and off the field. Uh, and this can be sports specific content. So DeAndre Hopkins, he's an investor in our company. You can learn how to become a better wide receiver through him. Or it can be off the field content right around personal branding, mental health, financial literacy. Uh, we produce this all in-house to keep the cogs down, uh, but here's an example of our financial educational content. What's up, everybody? I'm Brandon Copeland, NFL linebacker and financial education professor at the University of Pennsylvania. My body's down, body down. You ready to play football, baby? No player wants this. You end up on the next ecosystem of, of being the broken player so. for two years. So that's just an example uh, of the content. So again, these resources, this is what the value add to the student athlete is. We're going to give you the free products, the free photos and videos, the free educational content. Again, the brands, they subsidize these costs, they pay for these efforts, and in turn, get access to that first party data. Uh, what's great about SQL is we get paid to get users. Uh, and what I mean by that is we'll get into an um, annual recurring agreement with the city. They'll essentially offload all their youth sports tournaments to us. 
And it's typically a list of, you know, 50, 100 events, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 participants per event. We'll send our videographers to this event. Again, we have a 97% app download rate. So, you know, 900 plus people downloading per tournament at 50 tournaments per, per city. You know, it, it adds up to quite a bit of a number of users. Uh, and again, we get paid to do this. So that's really how we optimize user acquisition is getting paid at these large athletic events, uh, provide a value add to the customer, but also to the athlete side of things. And that's what really hooks them into the SQL ecosystem. So as it pertains to customer growth, uh, Cities is the large unlock for SQL. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we were just in one city and we're now in more than 20 cities uh, across the United States. We've had three first call sales. Uh, and the big win is we have the entire state of Maryland. And for us on the low end, a city brings about 50,000 users per year. Uh, and we get paid to do that again. Uh, on the social impact side of things, you know, we don't just get a customer, uh, we grow them. So Adidas you knows a $10,000 pilot that began in October of 22. It's now a four year million dollar contract that we expect to grow. And then on the league side of things, uh, our partnerships with the NHL, with the NBA have grown year over year. Uh, but I'd like to highlight, we also do work in the non-traditional sports space. Uh, we have a partnership with PBR uh, that is professional bull riding not Pabst Blue Ribbon, and uh, they pay us to really grow the sport of bull riding amongst the youth. Uh, that started kind of out- both. PBR is kind of both, Pabst Blue Ribbon and- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After this, it's going to be a Pabst Blue Ribbon for me. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> hey, in 11 months, you know, that grew from a $25,000 one-time pilot uh, to now a four-year $1.39 million deal. So here's where we're at from a financial perspective. You know, again, last year was first year doing revenue. We did a million and booked. Uh, 885 came in the door. Uh, you know, had a, a loss of about three hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars. And this year, on pace to do actually around three and a half million in ARR. We're currently profitable and expect to have you know five hundred and twenty five hundred and thirty thousand dollars positive EBITDA. So again, the unlock is these cities been a big driver for SQL and really why Cal, why our existing investors, why our chairman is, you know, encouraged us to do our series A, but we used to go athlete to athlete and say, Hey, sign up for our app, sign up for our app with the cities unlock. Again, we grow users and we get paid to do it. So really taking advantage of how many cities can we be in and how quickly can we grow that vertical of the business, knowing that that builds the community and the revenue opportunities that come with it. Uh, at the end of the day, you all know this, you can have a great strategy, a great vision, but you need a team. Uh, Bryant is my best friend from high school that grew up in that lower economic environment. Uh, he heads our ops and our impact work. Jamal Bevels, uh, former collegiate athlete at the University of Richmond, he heads our product efforts. Uh, and then our chairman, Don Rainey, um, has really built his excellence, his, uh, you know, credibility in the venture world and building large consumer audiences. He's taken six companies from our stage to Unicorn, and he's leading this funding round. Obviously, we have some big names on the right. Uh, the one that I love most is the one that you probably don't know. It's John Chapman. Uh, you know, he's the founder of a do-good company, similar to SQL, that he grew uh, exponentially. You know, Cal was an early investor in there. Uh, similar concept that is us. You know, they sold for $750 million dollars. Uh, 24 months ago. So again, you know, we're profitable. We're doing this raise to, uh, you know, grow our team right now. We have seven full-time employees. Uh, we're going to add a uh, head of engineering. We're going to add a, um, a head of cities. We're going to poach a current customer in the city space. You know, we don't know this space that well as sports stores and we just happen to be in it. Obviously it's a, it's a large driver for SQL but they're going to help us be in uh, every city uh, around the entire country. And then we're going to get a B2B, you know, head of sales that can get us into these large organizations on both the social impact and marketing side, the Nikes, the Under Armors, the Pumas of the world. So yeah, raising five, you know, Don and his group are investing two up to 3 million. Uh, and we have about a million left. And again, our first close is today. So it's been quite a busy day for me, but uh, I'm glad I'm here. So that's our story. Happy to answer any questions. And uh, yeah, Garrett, Cal, thanks for setting this up.
Hey, Robert, well, first, congrats, congrats on uh, on the close. Definitely, definitely a major accomplishment. And, and Cal, thanks for sharing the opportunity. That's uh, questions from the group. I'll, I'll throw a question out there while we wait real quick, uh, while everyone thinks. Can you talk a little bit about your retention? You mentioned 97% download at the events. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about how you're engaging that audience so that they, they come back to the app post-download, post that initial content stream? Uh, is it yeah. coaching? What, what, what is the thing that's bringing them back? Yeah, great question. So that's something where we're nowhere near where we want to be yet, just to be completely transparent. We're going to invest heavily in that. Uh, but what brings them back right now is the educational content, content so that masterclass experience. Uh, and then we do product giveaways. So, you know, get these CPG brands, get a Gatorade, get a, you know, buy a seal by filling out this survey, interact with your teammates. Um, and then really, you know, we really are looking to grow that uh, part of the business, Garrett. So that's really what's keeping them coming back right now. But, you know, we're going to invest heavily in that with this capital. Awesome. Well, I would, uh, I would in in encourage you to speak with a, another portfolio uh, CEO on, on the call, Mike. Uh, I, I could see some ways you can monetize that audience, uh, helping parents save and invest in their kids' future as well. Uh, or uh, there, there's always synergies here between uh, portfolio companies. So other, other questions from the group? Not all at once. I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. gosh, I don't know why my alarm just went off. Apparently I need to wake up. Uh, uh, Amanda, you look like you have a question. I, I can see it. I can see it on your face. <laughs> me um not not necessarily at the moment okay um, i'm sorry i thought maybe i misread it you you look like you were leaning in there uh, come on a anybody here I don't, I don't have a question but i wish this was angel stage a stage instead <laughs> well i would i would say it's it, it's it's not drastically far off i would say as, as a band we've invested in a, a handful of deals uh that are in this range so why don't you go ahead what's your question no, maybe for maybe for later stage, late stage sig. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, I, I have a question, uh, Bill. Um, I know um, a lot of the potential college athletes don't go to standard high schools or public schools. They go to these kind of athletic oriented high schools. Um, do you see those as a potential market? Um, and if not, why not? If so, how how do you work them in? Yeah, good question. Uh, so you're probably referring to like the IMGs in the world. Um, yeah, great schools. We've done some work with them. Really for us, you know, we took the high school approach. Let's let's adopt user or let's get user adoption from high schools. Uh, but you actually get not much coach buy-in, you know, obviously outside of IMG, right? Like, you know, you have coaches making $50,000, $60,000 a year as a teacher. Are they really going to spend time helping us get athletes on the platform? Uh, and that's why we've taken the city approach of let's work with cities to get user adoption because you know we're getting paid to do that. High schools definitely won't pay us to do this because they don't have, you know, budgets. Even IMG wouldn't throw money at this. But you know, hopefully that provided some clarity. What do you think of as your next fundable milestone? Where where are you? Where is this business going to be in two years? Uh, uh, and and what do you envision? raising at that point in time or do you think that you just want to uh, try and grow profitably at that point in time what's uh, can you walk us through a little bit of the longer term roadmap and your your vision for an exit down the road yeah good question so uh you know two years from now like as i mentioned to start right the city's angle garrett is new for us we're going to hire head of cities we want to be in 200 cities by the end of the year next year uh obviously with that that comes with the indigestion of users so, you know, we really want to be doing 10 million in ARR by the end of the year next year. Uh, so that really puts us two years from now. We believe, you know, if we have that type of user adoption, we can make the platform more sticky doing 10 million in ARR, that this can be a nine figure company. And ultimately we see us selling to a media company, someone that wants access to this, you know, 13 to 18 year old demographic uh, that's growing, um, or it could be, you know, a current customer like an Adidas, right? That wants access to every youth athlete and their families and wants that do good component as part of their uh, you know, their business. So that's that's really what we see. So we're going to invest heavily in teams so that we can accomplish those things. So we have time for one last question. What's your um, kind of biggest inhibitor to scale right now on the challenge side? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, we need a brand like B2B salesperson, um, to be completely frank. We need someone that can get us into these large organizations that want to make uh, an impact and reach this younger audience. You know, LinkedIn DMs got us uh, here, but we need someone that has great relationships and, you know, we're willing to invest quite heavily in that person that can get us, you know, at the right people and decision makers at these large companies. So if anybody knows anybody, I will pay them very well. Well, hey, uh, Robert, thank you so much uh, uh, for on on the day you made the close, still pitching. That I think that speaks to who you are and the hustle. Because uh, I, I would uh, I go celebrate. Go yeah, celebrate. and drop your contact info in the chat and and go and enjoy your enjoy your evening. You certainly deserve it, man. So hey, thanks for the time, Garrett. We'll talk. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to following up. Yeah. Bye. Okay. I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing me talk, so I'm going to pass it off to my partner, Elizabeth, who's going to get to introduce the next founder, uh, and I'm uh, really excited. To, I will share that uh, I, I knew that, Whitey, I knew that when we met that I recognized you, and you are a past Most Fundable Companies winner uh, as well, so uh, it's a, a group that we sponsor, uh, too. John reminded me of that in the text chat, so Elizabeth, you want to take it away with the intro? I'm really happy that you can, you can join us tonight. Sure. Yeah, um, so so Whitey Medina is a seasoned, been there, done that kind of entrepreneur. And um, currently he's applying both traditional and innovative data streams with AI on top of that to high value crops within agriculture. Um, so this type of data is especially relevant as climate change has more and more of an impact. Um, and so anyway, it's 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 a it's a really worthwhile problem that he's working on and and I'll I'll let you take it away, Whitey. I, I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Um and, and thank you so much as well, Carrot, for the opportunity to to be here presenting. And yeah, definitely the most fundable uh company's experience was was a, a great uh a learning learning car, curve, I would say exponential learning curve for us. So always always great to participate there. Um Right now, I'm I'm uh, representing a, a great group of innovators, and I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully, hopefully you can see my presentation, and we are past that. So, excellent. So, yeah, I'm um I'm representing a great team of innovators with with work together already for, even though the company is fairly new, we worked together for a couple of years already, um, working for um, NASA SBIRs. And uh, we decided to we decided to uh, join forces under a, a new banner, um, Bright Forge. And as we, um, as we developed our, our plan of attack for new SBIRs, uh, we, we discovered uh, an opportunity, an opportunity to um, have a great impact on agricultural technology. We, we found a very, very nice blue ocean opportunity to exploit. And that's what we're gonna be presenting to you today. Um, um, I, I basically work as the CEO of the company. My expertise goes back to uh, miniaturization of technology and wearable uh, sensor technology for companies like uh, Apple, Fitbits, and others. Um, and in our team, we have a great uh, 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 a scientific uh, person under Chad Lieber. Um, great um, management and business management with Christine and and definitely new talent coming up uh, with uh, with uh, on the engineering department for development um what we what we found is that um one of our technologies which was working uh, on a wearable for plant health um and that was particularly for a NASA application could definitely have down to earth applications um, knowing, knowing the utilization of nutrients, knowing the hydration level, knowing particular stress points of, of plants is not something that only applies to space exploration, but definitely has immediate and important applications down on Earth. Um, the problem that we all know 
Okay, hey, ready? Your, your slides aren't progressing. Um, we're, we're still on slide one. You're still on slide one. Hmm. We're seeing the um, like the presentation. I don't know if you're yeah. in presentation mode, but we're seeing it out of presentation yeah. mode. Sometimes if you click in that bottom uh, right, that little present sort of button next to the, the mm -hmm. minus sign, that will should help you enter uh, present, present mode. Are we still there in the presenting mode? Are we still there with, with the first slide or have you seen a yeah. move on the yeah. slides? <clears throat> Hasn't changed. Let me try that sharing again and see if we're looking out. Apologize for that technical issue. There we go. Excellent, excellent. So um, this was the slide when I was talking about my team. Hopefully when I change now, you can also see a change uh, to the next slide and please confirm yep. if you did. Excellent, Got it. we're working now. So uh, I was starting to talk about the problem, uh, food production. Um, it needs to increase 50% by 2050. Uh, there, there, there's a challenge to that because on top of that, we have some uh, climate change uh, problems that are, are throwing a curveball to our, to our um, agricultural environment. And they need new tools to adjust to the reality of that climate change. Uh, there are already technologies that are working on a, on a high level solution of this thing, right? This is direct inspection, um, screening with drones or satellite inspection. And, and definitely when you talk about all of this thing, right, is the either the cost of the solutions or if you're going with a traditional uh, type of method to analyze how your crop is doing uh, via lab uh, testing, then you're talking about delayed in the response of, of those labs. Therefore, already the time to react has been gone. Um, we identified that the opportunity to have a tool where you can go on a uh, plant to plant basis and have um, geospatial um, um, data saved for the for that particular plant over the crop and uh, and that you can make basically a heat map of the conditions of your crop allows agri uh, the agricultural um, and and uh, and the agricultures the uh, all of the all of the people involved meaning um, agronomers um, in the case of of the particular market that we show enologies it keeps the information of the heat map of what's going on with a particular uh, points in the crop and they can adjust uh, immediate solutions to uh, prevent any potential catastrophe on the current on the current crop. So what we've done is that we have taken existing NIR technology, things that have been proven for the last 40 years, right? And, and we did not reinvent the wheel on that. What we decided to do was to make sure that we have this package into a portable system and that can portable system we we use to go on that plant-to-plant -plant analysis and that we can then apply models uh, to the data acquired. And with that, those models, we can identify basically the stress points of that plant, right? So we can identify the utilization of nutrients, the usually NPK, um, or micronutrients as an next step. We can, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, check the hydration level of the plant and utilization of, of, of water resources, which um, it, it's becoming a major a major issue and situation um, all over the world. And, um, and, and one of the things that we're working on is on detecting early detection of diseases, right? There's a, a reaction of the plant to, um, to a potential or, or a disease that, that you do not have the physiological representation of that, right? So a visual inspection will not tell you anything. But on the chemical side of things, you can detect that the plant is already trying to defend itself, right, from, from diseases. And, and what we are offering with this information is, is per prescriptive results, right? So it allows 
um, a fast reaction. It allows to uh, make sure that there's fast, fast corrections to the issue, protection of the of the crop overall, um, and prevention of loss of, of a portion of the crop, right? Um, the, the market and an applicable market for this thing, right? The, the time of it is, is, is immense, right? So the number that you see here is, it's, it's, a, it's basically, um, instead of taking every crop in the world, right? We decided to identify a, a vertical that, that was um, easier uh, to go with, that had the means to um, um, a, a pay for a device like the one that we will be offering, that is hungry for the information, uh, and that it's um, that likes to uh, test new technology. When we when we went through all of the agriculture uh, market, we identified viticulture as as uh, as one of the ones that that checked all the marks. Um, that particular vertical is is uh, seventy nine million dollars. A portion of that, in a like, it will be a surprise for everybody. A minimal portion of that market is on the United States uh, West Coast, but most of the opportunities in Europe. As a matter of fact, it's exactly what I am right now, and it's a beautiful three a.m. in the morning here in um, Malaga, Spain, where I am working towards. Uh, uh, communicating with our potential uh, customers, learning their pain points and, and reacting to that with our product. The truth is that when you um, when you consider which of those potential that that Sam that Tam uh, would be would be willing to go with a product like ours is about 20% of that time. So so that 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 will be the market that that it's serviceable for us right now. Um, what what is being done today, right? So um, today there are um, solutions that use aerial surveillance, um, NDVI, um, EVI, um, which is basically image processing, image check of your current condition of the crop. Uh, on the other side, there's leaf testing and soil testing. All of these things are indirect to the to the goal of identifying problems within the plant, which is going to produce your fruit, right? Um, so they they could be considered uh, measurements by proxy. We are we are going directly to where the core information is needed to the plant level. It doesn't mean that we are substituting any of these measurements, what we are being is complementary to these measurements. So uh, we should not be considered a competition to, to any of the existing alternative methods that are available. Uh, we are a tool that directly complements what is there, adds uh, incredible value to the data that is being acquired today. Um, and more detailed information of what's happening at the plant level, which is better than any of the uh, current alternatives that, that, that are out there. Um, what we propose as a solution is our, our flora system. You saw a, a, a picture uh, before of the unit. Um, it's, a portable, it's a portable system. Um, the beauty of that is that um, it, it we are now focusing on a particular market, uh, but the same hardware could be used for, for other type of, of crops, right? So we have identified one particular market that we want to, to focus our attention um, and where we already are in the process of signing agreements for pilot testing. Um, but it's it's a is an incredibly adjustable system on the software side, which means that new modules could be learned for other um, other uh, different types of crop with the same importance or even even larger potential markets. Right, um, where we are today, um, we we are at the point that we have already a a working hardware uh, that we uh, need to. Um, in a fast track, augment the data that we have. Um, as I said, we're focusing on BT culture models right now. 
So we definitely will be using funds towards making sure that we get all of that information. We improve our current models uh, for BT culture. Uh, we also work on the um, on the user interface to present usable information to to the uh, to the user. Um, and and we definitely have to work on the, the, the data structure that goes uh, that goes beyond uh, or goes you know in the back of that in the back end of that. So that's where where this particular um, this particular um, round and funds will be used. It is considered our seed round. Um, we believe that because of our market analysis and the reaction of the things that I am personally doing right now, which is a, a direct to direct to potential um, customer uh, conversations, there is a good possibility that that uh, there will be um, uh, revenue generated immediately um, after this this first round. And, and any potential future round will be just for, for growth purposes, if, if that will be the case. Um, I, I wouldn't go too much into the numbers other than, yeah, it is what, what uh, a, a lot of us founders tend to present, beautiful numbers, rising charts, but there is, there's backup data that we have available for anybody that asks where these numbers come from. So I can provide that, but as you can see, the 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 uh, projections are are extremely good. Um, the growth when you start going into new models, new uh, crops, and new uh, verticals of the uh, agricultural uh, market overall, then then is is uh, exponential really on the on the sales of unit and also um, on the subscriptions for maintenance of that software that is providing that data. Um, as I, uh, one of the things that are future applications for the system, right now we're focusing on, on leaf analysis to, to learn the, the, the overall health of the plant. But uh, immediately after that, we will go into now fruit analysis with the same device, new models, um, and now we start to get a full circle piece of information of what's happening with the plant. For the case of viticulture, it will be extremely important. Um, this is a very unique uh, agricultural vertical because instead of uh, their interest being on the total health of the plant is how much am I stressing the plants and which are those stress points, which was very unique for us to learn that that they want to stress the part of the plant on purpose, but they don't have the dials. They don't have the information. They don't have the black and white information that allows them to uh, turn those dials in the right direction to get high quality fruit product. So um, our system will definitely will be providing that information. And when we add the analysis of the fruit, we can make that full circle. Other markets that we have briefly discussed with coffee, seed, uh, coffee, citrus, olives. Obviously, here in Spain, that's a major, that's a major uh, interest. Uh, but those will be future potential models to add to to the current to the current software packages that we will offer. Um, we are uh, raising a million dollar at a five point five million dollar valuation. Um, and uh, details on on the safe note, uh, which is the method that we are preferring to use, could be shared with everybody. And I am open to questions. Hope that I kept it um, short so that we can go to questions. Yeah, well, we, we, we have a, a few minutes for questions. Just one quick uh, point of clarification. The 5.5 million is safe. Is that a, a post-money cap or a pre-money cap on that safe? That is a pre-money cap. Free money cap. Okay. I'm going to make sure others can ask questions uh, in the group. You know, I'm new to the party. Can I ask a question, though? Yeah, of course, Fred. Go for it. Thank you. Um, your work um, with uh, the viniculture, are you working with any any brands right now on that? Well, so, in fact, what we, what we decided to do was work with... Uh, with the, on two particular ends with people that are connected with multiple wineries 
um, and that our leaders in, in viticulture, particularly in Italy, in Verona, we have uh, a, an agronomist that is also an analogist that is working as a uh, director of projects for a particular winery, um, which is, is pushing this product in, in, uh, in Verona on a couple of, of wineries. And then in the US, we have somebody uh, that is helping us in, uh, believe it or not, in the San Luis area for very small micro wineries. Um, and we are searching for a similar position on the West Coast. Uh, so, so definitely that. Um, yes, there are some brands. Uh, we have not completed the signature on those documents. So I hope that that in within the next couple of weeks we can share the names of of who those companies are but they are i can tell you they are major players um on the on the viticulture environment okay well if, if one of them is not antonori and and you're moving this along you should see me because i'm you know they've been making wine since the 1300s in italy 27 generations of winemakers and i'm very close to the their family, both in Italy and in the U.S., they're expanding in California right now. I'm actually helping them acquire a, a 900 acre property here. So um, I can uh, reach out to you if you leave your contact info. I can reach out to you afterwards and see where you are. That that part is particularly interesting, especially since you're talking about the stressing of the plants. That's what makes the really good wine. Exactly, exactly. Although, I'm definitely will contact you. <laughs> I will definitely contact you directly, uh, Frederick. So thank you for that. Fred, any, any other questions? Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Great. We have we have time for one more question, and we have to take the questions over to chat. I, can I just ask something? Maybe I missed this, uh, but uh, is there a U.S. entity? Yes, it is okay. a U.S. entity. We have offices in both the U.S. and Spain. Okay, so, sorry, I missed yeah. that. Yeah. Um, actually, Garrett, can I just ask just a follow on question? Of course. Um, so the minimum investment size, I thought like for a seed raise, I thought that was a little too high if you're going towards uh, or if you're, um, you know, seeking them from from angels, even some super angels as well. Do you have like wiggle room for that for the minimum investment? Definitely. Size? Definitely. Okay. That All is right. open for that is basically a starting point as a baseline for the conversation. OK. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think what we 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 generally see is uh, as long as a group is sort of collectively coming in around a, a, a certain target, then there's usually usually founders are pretty rece uh, pretty receptive, as I know you you know Asli. For those of you, yeah. uh, Asli's have been in the inve angel investing space for 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 some time and has a lot of ex uh, experience there too. We're really lucky to to have her. If you just joined the meeting now, as our uh, as our executive director from the from the band. Um, uh, Wine, thank you so much again for, for joining us. I know the Q&A was a little bit uh, uh, shorter, but please stick around and share your contact info. And uh, Elizabeth, thank you for uh, uh, finding this awesome opportunity and, and sharing it with the group. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna move on to our, our last uh, uh, presenter, uh, but certainly not least uh, with uh, Neda uh, from, uh, where are you? Uh, are you? Oh, there you are. Hopefully you can come on video here. And uh, uh, we're going to learn more about Isano Health. And she is the CEO. And uh, actually, one of the things that really stood out, actually, when I was doing a little bit of research on the opportunity was just her background. Goodness, uh, everyone, everywhere from Roche to Abbott Laboratory to Medtronic, to Baxter Bioscience, uh, they, they really... Uh, uh, they really must have recruited you hard to, to put you in that CEO seat and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the future of breast cancer detection, which is obviously an incredibly uh, uh, important, uh, uh, you know, uh, an important cause, an important uh, uh, space to be operating. I know I uh, have uh, have done a, a little uh, a, a little bit on the, on the on the charity side in that in that space as well in the, in the past, having had my family impacted by it pretty substantially. So I'm really excited to hear from you uh, this evening and uh, and really appreciate you making the time for us this evening to uh, so we can learn about the future of detection. Thank you. Thank you so much. On the chat, I put my contact information. Every day, 110 Americans die because of breast cancer until we do something about it. 
My name is Nader Zavi, as Gareth mentioned. We are on a mission to catch cancer early and save more lives. If you look into the US market, despite the spending $29 billion on the mammography procedure, 44,000 Americans died because of their cancer wasn't detected in early stages. We all know breast cancer is the most treatable cancer and 99% will have a five-year survival rate if the cancer is detected in early stages. There are only five cancers that are having national screening program in the US. Breast is one of them. So why, despite being at all reimbursed and paid for, only half of the US population is doing their mammography and um, doing their exam? Because simple, mammography is inadequate for a dense breast population. It doesn't see the cancer. The sensitivity goes as low as 36%. And 50% of American women, up to 70% of Asian women have a dense breast tissue. It is a painful procedure and exposes women to ionizing radiation. Also 28 million women in the US have at low access to radiology and there is a radiology desert. I mean, this is a picture for gentlemen in the, in the room, ask your loved ones and uh, ladies in the house um, that looks like a uh, torture chamber is painful procedure also is uh, radiation. Um, the alternative to mammal right now as a standard of care is either ultrasound or an MRI. In an ultrasound, you go in there and there is a manual ultrasound. You see the lady in the picture is highly operator dependent. You need a sonographer that performs the task and capture the image. The problem with it is there is a big shortage of breast sonographer because breast sonographers are more advanced in uh, the licensor. Also, it is very complicated. It's, it's, um, the reproducibility of the image from one to one varies a lot depending on who the sonographer is. These systems take up a lot of the space in the room and, um, and also they take long, 30 to 40 minutes to do the scan. Then the, the other option in ultrasound is automated breast ultrasound. These are, and this company Delphinus just launched last year. Their phenomenal technology is a supplemental to screening. They spent $130 million so far to get a PMA, and their last raise was $12 million on $230 million valuation. But notice these are big beds. They're designed for a radiology center. Not every location has a space to allocate to them. And also some of these technology are still too, um, too old to school. The, uh, 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 MRI, no need to tell you, MRI is expensive, insurances, sometimes decline them as a supplemental screening and they are not designed for access. Uh, also for MRI, woman has to do an injection, um, which is different. With that said, with knowing all the challenges, we came up with Isonos Atusa. It's the world's AI powered automated 3D ultrasound that does the scan in only two minutes. That's 15 times faster than doing it with a handheld uh, ultrasound. I will show you a video. Um, this device is already FDA cleared and patented. Um, I will show you a video and I will tell you all these benefits that I listed on my um, slide and later on take a look at the slide and uh, to read them. So um, what iSona offers is increases accuracy because the job of the sonographer is automated. So you don't need a sonographer at the point of care, any medical assistant, even I did the sonography scan without the help of anyone. Our CTO actually got sick, couldn't show up in the very first customer demo. So on the phone in 20 minutes, I learned how to do a high quality scan of a breast. Um, so the operator uh, puts this bra on the patient, uh, positions the patient, uh, lays them down, pours water instead of gel for coupling medium, and we only use um, water, and then attaches the drainage bag on the side. And so when the scan is over, they can um, drain that and let the system perform the uh, operation. We do not deform the um, breast tissue, or we, do, we don't do a flattening of the breast. Um, they also alleviate the workforce, not only is faster, but also they don't need, the, the clinicians don't need to hire a, a staff. We enhance the detection by using machine learning and quantitative ultrasound in the back end to increase the accuracy. And also because of the size and portability, we can, for the first time, we can offer high quality scan of a breast 
outside the traditional offices. Think about a woman going to OBGYN office and also in the screen you can see right now um, all of the system setting that usually is done by an operator with all those knobs are fully automated. So you'll see the scan happening without any touch uh, automatically. That's by itself is a big innovation, but there's a lot of things that goes in our software. Our software is able to show MRI-like image at the ultrasound price. Uh, also, we are able to do a 3D visualization of the image. The problem we're solving for clinicians is giving them a tool to make revenue and improve the patient experience and allow them to offer high quality image at the point of care in their offices. Um, these are some technical information. Uh, if you're interested in the detail, what I'm trying to tell you, we capture a lot of images. The image is like 540 frames with sublimiter resolution. So when you look at the 3D visualization, 25% of breast surgeries are repeated because the surgeon didn't remove or incite enough margins of the cancer. But this image, they can see how far they need to incite. Or if you look, when I said the MRI-like image, this coronal view is not available in any ultrasound unless they are 3D automated breast ultrasound. Uh, we have done 180 patient study and compared our device to a handheld ultrasound to show that we are comparable to them. One of our site that is still running a study is Baylor. We have a site outside the US and we have a site in South San, San Francisco. The market I'm presenting to you is tremendously large, $14 billion market. And you see me putting numbers here, our go-to market will be focused on a smaller part of the market where the breast surgery centers are having a high risk patient volume. And then we will expand our uh, market to a broader market down the road. Uh, I'm not gonna walk you through all the details, but these slides will be shared. We are standing out, Atusa is the name of our product. We stand out clinically, operationally, and financially. Um, when a hospital or a, um, a clinic buys our product, in two and a half months, they are break even, and they're making money. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot of advantages that we offer compared to the handheld ultrasound or automated ultrasound. This one compares our AI to everything out there. There's a lot of companies that the entire being of companies one feature of AI product. We offer a turnkey solution that all is in on. There is only one disclaimer I should say, our product, all of the hardware and software that I've showed you is FDA cleared. Our AI will be submitted next year to FDA. And because we have too many AI products, there are six products that you see on my screen, we'll do tranches of submission next year. Every two product will be bundled for one submission. So if I were to put the entire market in two axes, where the bottom axis is showing you portability and cost of the product in the ultrasound space, and the um, vertical axis is showing you advanced imaging, we have created a new category of ultrasound that is a point of cure 3D uh, automated ultrasound. Everything else on the bottom requires a sonographer that has all the problems that I told you. Everything in the automated space is too large, too expensive, too big. It's not gonna do the job. There's a lot of technicality advancement that our team has accomplished. We have patents, three patents, three pending, and more that we are filing. We just partnered in two months ago with Belson Cincini. Uh, so our patent strategy is one of the ways of generating value for us. Um, our go-to market, there is a lot of different application that our product could be used for. However, and because our FDA label is general ultrasound, we could be used for monitoring or diagnostic. We're gonna focus only on supplemental screening for dense breasts. This market has a lot of literature and is proven. Um, we will focus on private clinic on the breast surgery centers that are 65% privately operated. And they have a shorter cell cycle than hospitals per se. If you look into the breast surgeons as persona, they are technology enthusiasts. They do a phenomenal job. They make intuitive surgical very really successful for that reason. They like getting new products in their hand. They always look for ways to improve their efficiency. Um, and they are uh, usually a smaller market uh, with a shorter sales cycle. So when you go after a small market, once you have a key opinion leader hub and they like and vouch for you and they talk about you on the podium, it's easier to 
bring the rest of the uh, group in. I've had tremendous interest organically coming to us from rural radiology, from uh, federally qualified health centers, from private and mobile imaging clinics that all have shown interest to purchase our product. I will not bore you with this slide. When you receive it, what you need to know on the right-hand side are all the reimbursement codes that are available to reimburse this product. Uh, CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid, pays $220 per woman, and private insurances paid up to $750 per woman. What, to, to do the math, if a center acquires this product, and they only scan three women in a day, um, they will make 171,000 to 558,000 per year. Um, so, um, and three women a day, it's too small. Usually centers, the high volume centers, they have between 40 to 55 women a day and low volume centers usually have 10. Uh, so three is absolute minimal. One of our uh, venture capitals that is already our venture right now, hired the third party to do a clinical validation and demand validation in the market. So when you receive the slides, take a look at the key opinion leader from Mayo Clinic, George Washington University, Texas Medical Center and Cleveland Clinic, and there are a few more in the next slide from Harvard and other places where they talk about how much need they have for a product like ours in the market. Um, I also want you to pay attention, Sam Altman, we are a Y Combinator company. So Sam Altman himself was extremely excited when he saw this product. Um, Mr. Bulur Furush was not our, um, uh, now he's our um, um, advisor. He's on our advisory board, which is uh, phenomenally good. He was interviewed at, at that time, we didn't have a relationship. So we have a razor and blade revenue model that are both in pay, per patient or per scan and capital expenditure. In this market, capital expenditure is a standard um, and, um, and um, you know, um, oh, sorry. I meant to do this one. Um, and in this market, capital expenditure is a standard, but because we are taking an unconventional route to radiology, we are going to breast surgery centers, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna give them a, a different way of charging them. Um, we will have a recurring revenue because of the disposable associated with the product. And we will have our scanner price at 48,000, which is one third of manual ultrasound and one fourth of automated breast ultrasound. I'm expecting 100 plus million revenue in six years and 65% profit margin, 53% EBITDA. Uh, feel free to take a look at this. Um, we've had, um, oh, we have had a lot of interest from 562 leads that came to us, 163 came organically to our website. And those are private clinics, OBGYN, um, they are mobile clinics and some distributors. Um, this is like all these bubbles are showing you different acquisitions and exit in the market. The big players are Hologic, GE, Canon, Fujifilm and Philips. They are all having products in the industry, but nothing in, um, G does have one product in automated breast ultrasound, but all of the other ones are looking for ways to expand their footprint. I already have been tapped on the shoulder by three of these uh, companies on this slide. One of them is the largest mammography provider. And I know once we show product market fit and we show some early revenue, will be a very strong acquisition target. I am focused on building a sustainable business, uh, but I strategically entertain conversations. Uh, we have a small mighty team of five people on the right-hand side, everyone else that is providing hourly consultation to us. Um, I've listed six here, but we do have 12 different consultants that are doing clinical work, regulatory work, distribution, um, discussion and all kinds of different things. Our advisors from 10, I only list a few, uh, seven have had exits and successful CEOs. Um, Mr. Bulldorfush was the ex-president of Siemens Ultrasound. Ben uh, was at Intuitive Surgical and he launched multiple products there. He knows uh, development space. There are four sites that perform our clinical validation study at Vanderbilt Advanced Breast Care, UC Davis, UC San Diego. And we have some key members like Dr. Anderson, who was behind the Breast Cancer Initiative guideline that WHO published last year. We are raising a 2 million seed extension route. Um, that's a convertible note at $20 million cap. 
And um, that's going to unlock the four and a half million dollar uh, matching grant that NIH is going to give us. Plus, it's going to allow us to hire our commercial team and clinical team, pop, um, deploy our early customer access, which I planned for August, as well as prepare us for AI submission and next year. We have raised 8.6 million so far. A million point seven has been non-dilutive funding from NIH. Uh, SBIR. We are a Y Combinator com company, you, uh, Texas Medical Center company, and Rosamond Institute Rise um, and Innovative Company. We have received tremendous number of awards. My goal is to open up the Series A funding very soon, um, as soon as I close this round, which is my goal is in July. Um, and uh, my um, financial projection you saw was based on banking on the funding of Series A. Uh, my background, um, I have launched 65 products for top S&P 10 healthcare companies, health tech and tech bio. Some of the brand names, you know, like Abbott, like Roche, like Medtronic Diabetes and Baxter. I was an investor in um, Isona back in 2019, like all of you angels. Uh, and um, when I was tapped on the shoulder to join the team, I gladly accepted with that, uh, join us in the success journey and invest in innovation with ISON. Thank you. Gerd, I see. You I, 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 I need to I need to click the unmute button a little faster. Uh, fantastic presentation. I got a, a couple of, a, of quick questions. I have in my I in my notes that the uh, so you have a core team of five. I have in my notes that the the burn is uh, currently around 50, 55 k. Is that is that right? And could you, yes, I'm not getting paid, and our CTO is not getting paid. I I, I was I was that was kind of a leading question. I I, I assume that uh, and that 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 level of skin in the game I think really signals to your your commitment to the company. Um, as far as the NIH matching funds, oftentimes it takes a, a little while to for those funds to actually hit. Can you talk about the timeline uh, for when you would expect that 4.5 million to actually uh, arrive and uh, for you to use? Thank you for the question. You're correct. And the four and a half million is over two and a half years. So two to 500K. And it is designed to run a 3000 patient study. Um, so as soon as we start performing the study, it will pay for R&D and clinical costs. That's why I am going after the um, funding from angels and VCs as well at the same time. Understood. Um, okay, I'll, I won't take all the questions. Other questions from the group? Oh, don't be shy, team. Actually, uh, I just had a question. I mean, first of all, this is this is amazing, Nadat. Congratulations on this. I feel like it's definitely going places. Um, in terms of uh, your raise, you said it was going to close end of July. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, in terms of the quality of the image, I understood that it was the, uh, the same quality as an ultrasound. Is it the same? So my question is: Is it the same quality of an ultrasound or? Uh, an actual, the big MRI, not the MRI, the big mammogram machines? Um, it's better than mammal in a dense breast tissue. And the quality depends on which, so ultrasound quality image are very subjective. Uh, comparison is if you are an iPhone user versus Samsung user, we've had constant argument with my brother. They tell me Samsung takes better, takes better picture and I think iPhone takes better picture. So depending on what that center is used to, but yeah. um, the better ways of looking at the images um, for comparing ultrasound, first is depending on which brand we're talking about. Second, we're, uh, it's, uh, this one is a raw image that you see. And then in the next slide, we do reconstruction and we have removed a lot of graininess and a lot of um, inclarities in there. Uh, so I would say we are better than mammal for a dense breast population. They have to show a study to claim anything more, which is possible. We might be claiming more and we are comparable to other ultrasounds. Okay. Um, all right, other questions. Except, except that we have this view that 
handheld 2D ultrasound doesn't have. So remember, we are a 3D ultrasound with the MRI-like image. So this one is not available in other handheld ultrasound. Okay. Even if they're 3D. Okay, thank you. Garrett, I have a question. Yeah, Cal, go for it. Uh, Nita, I know very little uh, about the science involved here, but it seems to me that you're competing with some really big companies. Why does this opportunity exist for you? That's a brilliant question. Thank you so much for that question. The, the opportunity exists because these large companies are all focused in big radiology centers. Their devices, if you look at the automated breast ultrasound, they're half a ton. Or if you look at the handheld ultrasound, it's a big car, they're all operator dependent. So they have opened up a space for us where we can go around and first go point of care clinics, small clinics. Um, I mean, when I say small, a lot of these clinics are the ones that write prescription to send the patient to automate it, to, to receive ultrasound or MRI in the centers. So for the first time, we have a device, a tool that they didn't have before. So we, and it's a turnkey solution. There's a lot of different things they can do with the solution. So we are going where the large providers are not able to go. And if you were follow up question was, oh, Butterfly has a small um, device. And I will tell you that's not the case. So Butterfly cannot and will not uh, claim anything on breast. Breast tissue is very complicated. That's, that's why we chose breast as our first application. Second is Butterfly has the same problem that everybody else has. They require a sonographer and there is a big shortage. And the automation is a big deal that we have solved for. Um, and then the third thing is um, and breast is a very specialized place. They will need a lot of data and proof to get to the space that we, will, we are going after. We believe we will pave the way for the big players to acquire us because they won't have access to those markets we'll go after. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. I had one question. Yep, go for it. Um, you indicated one of your first slides that, uh, and by the way, I agree with your brother, Samsung all the way, um, but you <laughs> you uh, indicated that in the beginning that something like 49% of women don't get ma mammograms. Is that? Yes, is that yes, right? you're correct. Yes, half of, half of the population is not getting their mammogram. Yeah, and, and so although you're... Um, your your unit is is smaller and and probably less less painful or less uncomfortable. H how is that going to increase that percentage? What what is it about what you have that you're going to increase the percentage of women that get mammograms? That's a that's another good uh, question. Connecting the dot for the audience. Um, so remember, I said they don't like it because it's a bad experience. So if I go, I asked my doctor at the Stanford. What do you do if I don't go for a mammal? He said, I'll write ultrasound for you. So the very first thing is, if the woman is refusing to go to mammal, either because they have an implant or they hate it, or they say, I don't want radiation, um, they will be sent to ultrasound. So they will have an option that's much better than doing a 2D ultrasound. Second problem is some of these don't do a mammal because they don't have access. We are more accessible. We can be in a church, in an OBGYN office. We can be shipped to CBS Medical Clinic. You can have a nurse take this to someone's home. It's so small that uh, removes the barrier. I wish I had it here. Have you seen a Roomba? The I have seen there? a Roomba. I invented the Roomba. Okay, so the, <laughs> the Roomba, the vacuum cleaner, this is like a brush Roomba. It's as small as this round circle. It's really portable, not comparable what you have seen. And the patient experience, a lot of patients, because we pour warm water here, lukewarm water, they tell us this feels like a breast spa. So the patient experience and everything, but we are a highly regulated industry. Because of our label, I will not claim we are equivalent to mammo or anything like that. So our doctors will decide what's best for patient. Uh, you know, on, on the, on that one. Fred, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to take that. The questions, if you wouldn't mind dropping your email, yeah. you already shared your email in the chat. We're absolutely going to follow up with you. And I I know this is a bit of a brief format this evening, but the, the goal is to get a, you know founders as many founders as I can, as much exposure and, and dig in at a, at a certain level and, and 
I, I'm certain that you're going to have some some follow up from our group. So I, I'm sorry to, to to cut it there, but uh, I I got to. So thank you so so much for for joining us this evening and for the important work that you're that you're doing. Uh, and to all of our founders uh, uh, who presented tonight, um, I do want to uh, actually I, I neglected to introduce a founder who's going to present next month because I do like to do the coming soon. So I want to I want to give Zarina an opportunity to just say hello to the group uh, just very briefly before we get into our comments section for the for the night. Uh, but I had the chance to uh, 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 join and, and, and be a part of a panel at uh, SoCal Startup Day. Uh, last week, and you know, there was uh, a couple founders that that stood out, but uh, one who really uh, uh, stood out was Zarina and the way she she approached it and the passion that she exuded for the product. And I will let her talk about one, two, three, baby box, which is something that I would have definitely used uh, uh, when Skylar was little, had I had I known about it or had you existed then. But why don't you just say hello, give a quick little elevator pitch, and let the audience know what they can learn more about next month. Sure, thank you, Garrett. Hi everyone, my name is Serena Bahadur. I'm the CEO and founder of 123 Baby Box. And so 123 Baby Box really started off as an idea when I was a college student over at UC Irvine. Um, I saw that over 1,400 hours, that's the average time new moms spend researching products for their babies. From the latest and greatest toys to the new organic baby foods, new moms spend a lot of time and money on their babies. So I thought, you know, why is there not a service that can deliver everything the mom needs for their baby conveniently in monthly intervals? I know there's Amazon, but something a little bit more curated. Um, so I was a business school student at the time and I ended up starting the idea as a college student, ended up winning first place in our new venture competition out of 114 startups. And that's what really kickstarted my idea. Uh, we are in the market, we have launched, we have had two Two acquisition offers and now currently we're raising a pre-seed round of about 500k um, and we only have about 100k left of the round so I'm super excited to share with everyone next month more about our company um, and take any questions you guys might have so thank you so much for having me Garrett. Awesome and, and uh, drop a, a link and drop your email contact info uh, as well for, for the group and uh, and uh, thanks thanks again for, for joining us and uh, really uh, and for for walking up and introducing yourself and and, and doing uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to learn more. So uh, I'm going to ask the founders to drop off now if uh, I think that uh, or I'm going to if sometimes oh no yeah thank you Whitey we're going to ask you to drop off and um, and then we're going to talk about you guys just briefly and I think uh, a large chunk of the audience may uh, you know, I know it's the summertime and it's, it, it's tough to, to stick through two hours here. So for those who make it, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, Bill, why don't you share with me what you what you thought uh, about the company tonight and who your, your favorite uh, startup was this evening? Yeah, um, I'm going to divide my uh, comment into two sections. There's two companies with $20 million valuations. And I think the one I liked the best um, was sequel of the two um, just because I think there's a need out there for that, that I think I like. Um, the, of the other um, two companies in the valuation, um, less than 10 million, um, I like the ketone product. Um, I'm not sure people need it, but I know people buy it. And from a financial perspective, I think that has the best opportunity to succeed. Um, the wine guy, I, I would just like to see some data to validate that what he says he's going to do actually works. So I think the ketone guy has already shown some sales. That's why I like it. Great, thank you. Uh, Cal, would you like to uh, share what you, what you thought? Sure. Um, first of all, I, I just want to compliment you on choosing presenting companies. Um, I, I sit through a lot of organizations have a monthly or quarterly call like this and half the presenting companies are fluff. Um, I think every company that you showed us tonight was something I would look at. So um, I appreciate you valuing our time and, and presenting such quality companies. Um, in terms of a favorite, I'm a little biased. Bill, thanks for mentioning SQL. I'm already an investor there and I'm very excited about what they're doing. Um, but I like this last one too. Um, Obviously, a big need and a, you know a clear path to an acquisition. 
And I think for investors, um, at least ones like myself, we're looking for fairly early exits. And it seems to me if she deploys to some clinics, um, they're going to line up at her door to acquire it. I would agree. And I'll add just a one, one additional thought uh, onto that piece, just so I don't forget. That opportunity came through a gentleman named Sam Brad, who's an LP in our fund and a founder that I've invested in previously, who then exited and then built another company, and which is now backed by Sequoia. Uh, in the medical robotics space, and 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 Sam Sam knows talent in the space, and uh, when he sends over a deal like uh, this, I, I generally uh, jump at uh, uh, jump at the opportunity. So I, I think that uh, you know her pedigree speaks for itself. But uh, Fred, uh, thank you for this is your first time uh, attending, uh, I, and uh, I. Uh, I uh, had a chance to meet Fred again at the SoCal Startup Day, uh, and he's got a, a serial entrepreneur and an investor and, and helps founders through idea pros, and I'll let you share a little bit about yourself and what you liked. And thank you. I hope to see you back again. Fred, yeah, I think you're muted. Uh, I used all my best material while I was muted, so the rest is probably not going to be quite as interesting. Uh, but uh, I really enjoyed this, and 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 um, I think it was Kale that may have said it uh, that the the quality of the the folks that you brought here was was really great, and it's kind of what I try to do with the founders that I help because most of them don't have a clue and and are really pretty poor at pitching. I think these these folks all did a great job, and 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 I think that I I so no help. In fact, she's she's already written to me. Uh, I think if she could get something like that in the CVSs uh, around the country, then you would really spike up that that percentage of of women who who get mammograms to show up, no appointment, and get in, get out. I think I think that's an awesome possible play there, and, and I'm going to speak to her a little bit more on that. Great, uh, Elizabeth, you're up. Um, yeah, I I really agree with you, Fred. That's a um, I, I really like that one as well. And that'd be a really interesting play for them if they can, if they could make that happen. Um, yeah. so I think, you know, that one's, that one's really high on my list. I think, um, uh, sequel was really interesting as well, just as a, as someone who has experienced that, <laughs> that athlete path myself, I know there's a lot of, a there's a, a need there and a big disconnect. Um, so, so I enjoyed that one as well. And then, um, you know, I think, um, it, the whitey on the, um, on the ag side has some really interesting, um, ability to, to combine a lot of data types there that, that haven't necessarily been, um, really fleshed out for ag. And like I said, as the, as the, um, you know, climate change gets more relevant. I think there's going to be more of a need there. So, so that one as well. My, my one follow up I'd I'd really like to do on Isonos is um sometimes the FDA approval on on AI can be a little tricky. Um, so I just kind of want to get her perspective on um on the approach there. Great, Amanda. I don't have too much beyond what's already been said, I would say Isona was probably my favorite. Um, beyond that, I think um, Kinetic's the first one, kind of like what Bill was saying, it's definitely acquirable and people will always buy those those products. So those are probably the two that I would go with. I, I can say about Kinetic too, that I, I mean, I, I tried it. I drank all of the ones that were shipped to me. I don't know if it was the placebo effect or if, you know, I was imagining that I, that I was feeling good, but I do know it tasted it tasted good. They all disappeared. So that's, that's something. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, what do you think? Yeah. So, uh, I saw no near and dear to my heart. I lost my mother in law to breast cancer. So I think anytime you can get earlier detection, um, obviously the insurance companies playing a part in making sure that it's certain that's something that the patients can actually be in reimbursed for, um, I think would be critical to have a partnership or go to market with any of the insurance companies that say, yes, this is an approved. She kind of had it up there, but I'd, I'd like to unpack that a little more. Um, I really like SQL. Uh, I felt like, I think Devin's on the call, so I'll be to totally transparent. 
Um, I would like to see for Kinetic a little more total addressable market. I was a little concerned about the partnership with Lifetime and having that, that seems a little limiting to me. I would have liked to have seen them. There, there's such a broader market, you know, what, okay, great. We're going to start with athletes, but eventually you really need to be more accessible in convenience and grocery. So what's the strategy to get to those markets? Right. Thanks. Uh, Stender, if I, I believe Stender had to step away, I know that he had a dinner, so he may not be able to chime in. Uh, Chris, if oh, Stender, you made it back. I saw you. Well, Stender, our chairman emeritus. Hey, I, didn't, I didn't step away. I brought my wife in here. Where are you, Polly? I don't want to be seen. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Polly. But, 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 I'm but, supposed to have my clothes on, but, but I don't. <laughs> but this whole thing about <laughs> really got Polly's attention. I mean, we're we're focused on that issue and uh we're gonna follow up with this lady. That that was really she was very, very effective. Great. Yeah. Um, for me. Yeah. I, I never quite heard what the insurance pays for and what it doesn't pay for. I was a I, little I, I can share those notes I in my in my uh from our initial diligence call. So I'll, I'll share some of that information. Uh, okay. with you both and I, uh, Polly, I hope you join more of these with, uh, I say, I get to see in the background sometimes. We want to hear your opinion too. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Good to see you. Uh, Hunter, you're up. Yeah, I was a big fan of Isoda, but also, um, the, the, my favorite, I mean, uh, Kinetic was awesome, but SQL really stood out to me. I know it's a further on investment in the series A, but, um, I really like the product and I see like, I mean, the B2B route is always the best and they're really killing it. I thought it was very interesting. I looked into them beforehand and uh, was a big fan. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Hunter. Chris, are you able to come on video and share what you think? All right. Well, and Pablo, I don't know if you can come on video. Pablo is a founder of Clear Club, a portfolio company. He didn't present tonight, but I'll give Pablo a, 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 a plug here. If you're, if you're grinding your teeth, go to clearclub.com. He's got the largest direct-to-consumer night guard company in the country, and we, we invested, and he just became profitable last month. So, <laughs> Pablo, you want to sh share what you thought? Thank you, Larry. Um, I think that the... The last company, the breast cancer one, I think that one, if you know, if the solution works, it's as another yeah, investor commented, uh, they have, yeah, you get some clinics, clear path to growth, and then, yeah, acquisition immediately. So I think that that one looks very attractive. Um. And I agree also with other investors that commented that the level of the companies is is very good. So you're getting good uh, good deal flow. So well, it's, it's congratulations. A, it's because everyone who attends this call. So that's I mean that's really it's the the community that we're building here. So uh, thanks for uh, joining, sticking with us tonight, guys. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Uh, if you email me next week, I will respond, but I will pro be slower too because i'll be running around disney world with a 10 year old next week <laughs> then don't respond garrett yeah That's I don't know. well when she goes she falls asleep eventually uh eventually yeah and spend so, your time there it goes too quick yeah, yeah. And don't, then, don't worry it's only gonna be about 100 degrees yeah I, I know i'm gonna at least I'm, it won't be humid yeah. it will be humid <laughs> yeah oh, it. humor humor i get it <laughs> All right. Hey, have a, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thanks. Nice to meet everybody. Yeah, really, really thanks good. for inviting me. See you next Thanks, month. thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.